Hello, welcome back to Around the Museum with Joe and Diane as we have continued to wander and we're now over at a, an experiment which was done a number of years ago at Jurassic Arc and I've been able to see them and you've been there as well um, but uh, it's new since you were last here because we only did this at the beginning of this current year so um, this stuff right so well it's a it's a it's a big box uh plastic box we'll talk about why we've used a plastic box in a moment big old plastic box in the bottom we've put crushed up seashells then we've put raw portland cement and then we've covered the top with organic mulch and water and we added a little wick going through and uh, what we've ended up with are some wonderful stalactites now a little bit of uh, background information right if you open up your anti-creationist handbook which yes that is a real book uh, it will tell you that one of the biggest evidences against young earth creation is the stalactites and stalagmites because if we have a look at this fabulous great big stalactite from china that's next to you there diane um the argument is that stalactites grow at a tiny, tiny rate, at a rate of less than a millimetre a year. Now, if you're growing at a rate of less than one millimetre per year, how many hundreds of thousands of years is it going to take to produce a beautiful great big stalactite like this? And then the other argument is, well, in order to create a stalactite, you need a cave in the first place, and it takes hundreds of thousands of years to, you know, slowly erode out a cave. Therefore, the world cannot be only six to ten thousand years old it must be millions of years old that's the argument mm -hmm. and so what experiments like this do are they're real life experiments that you can come and see the real processes behind it which really challenge that idea of millions of years so the idea of stalactites first started in australia in terms of the these kind of experiments and stuff when when john set them up at jurassic park didn't they yes yes in fact we've still got one that's going at jurassic Arc. Uh, it was yes. way back in 2015 yeah. that it was first right. uh, first yes. set up, and I visited them in, in 2018, and they've uh, been doing pretty well since then. There's been a whole load of experiments that have ended up being developed off of the stalactites, yes. stalactites, uh, to do with fossilization stuff. Yes, yes, that's right. So it's it's been very interesting just seeing we were, even we were surprised at how rapid the process was, and how quickly things got buried in the stalactites at the bottom. Right. So where did this idea and inspiration for this come from? Well, it comes from uh, John's observations of limestone caves. This is John Mackay. Uh, John Mackay, yes, that's right. So he found that um, the best limestone caves were in places where there was a lot of vegetation, particularly forests where you get a lot of leaf litter and a lot of mulch mm. above the caves. So you've got lots of organic matter, and uh, that will of course, uh, percolate down through the soil and eventually into the cave underneath. And you've got the most magnificent stalactites. And, and he put two and two together and thought, well, something must be happening here. And it has to be more than just the chemical process because the reason that stalactites are considered to be so old and take so long to, um, to make is because calcium carbonate, which is what they're made of, oh. is not terribly soluble. Uh, so if you're trying to dissolve calcium carbonate, then precipitate it out, yes, that is a slow process. Mm -hmm. There has to be something more to it. And maybe all this organic matter, which will be full of microbes and mm -hmm. all sorts of um, other little creatures, lots of life going on there, lots of organic matter, uh, maybe that is the key to it. So we set up an experiment that had organic matter a source of calcium carbonate and percolating water. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the combination that you need. That's what was happening out in the real world. So let's make a miniature version of that where we can control uh, what goes into it and we'll see what comes out. And sure enough, what came out were genuine stalactites. Mm -hmm. And we know the genuine stalactites because Ooh. we can do a number of chemical tests on them as yes. well as mm -hmm. things like X-ray diffraction, which looks at the crystalline structure yes. and can compare the crystalline structure, the very makeup of these uh, experiment stalactites 
two ones that are in actual caves and they are yes. identical mm -hmm. and you can um, do pH testing as well yes. to test the acidity or the alkalinity mm -hmm. of these different drip waters and we've tested them in natural caves we've tested them from these machines and we've tested them in the uh, sort of fast growing um, styotides and stalagmites that you find on man-made structures things like yes. Canal tunnel, uh, mm. canal tunnels, and old castles and stuff like that. Yeah. And these are identical. These are not just thin veneers of calcium carbonate. A lot of times, they are good chunky solid stalactites, which are identical with every chemical test and even with the technical tests like X-ray diffraction. Now, going back to that calcium carbonate, which is the base material. Yes. Um, that's the base material that makes up seashells. Yes. So we're, we're creating, we're using natural calcium carbonate. Now, Portland cement. You've been to Portland. Yes. Uh, you went with us on the convention last year, yes. and it's yes. one of the uh, biggest producers of cement. So cement is just limestone yes. that has been uh, ground up and uh, has been baked in order till it's dry, and it changes the chemical composition slightly. But when you then mix it with water, it begins a chemical reaction, which allows it to then set and turn into instant rock, and we call it concrete, right? Um, but what we was interesting is we actually saw the chemical reaction change over time because when you first mix your cement together you get a very very high alkaline reading sort of 10 to 12 yeah. right um but by the time that it's changed to producing these stalactites and stalagmites in places like canal tunnels and we did this test and you can go and watch uh, church canal destroys millions uh, where we reported on this um the uh, ph has dropped back to seven to eight so yeah. almost to neutral matching those caves stalactites that we tested pretty nicely as well so there is actually a way of uh doing real research here and, and, and calibrating it um so we have our crushed ukc shells we have our raw port and cement and then on the top finally we have our organic mulch and water and you can see this is our mark one it's the first one we've tried in the uk stalactite machine started 26th of january 2023 that was about 10 months ago when we started it nine to ten months ago and you can see what it's been producing already. So we've got three lovely stalactites. Uh, tested all of these. These are all stalactites still dripping even to this day. We occasionally add some uh, fresh mulch at the top, which of course produces that uh, organic component, the microbial component. But we've also got these lovely uh, stalagmite formations, these hard rock formations there at the, at the bottom here. Now, this research hasn't gone without its criticism. No. Uh, one of the first criticisms was... This can't match modern cave environments mm. because you're using a big concrete trough. Yes. So what did we do in response to that? Well, we used another type of container. <laughs> it's a plastic container, right? You can't yes. be accused of, uh, of manipulating it because we're now using all natural materials inside of it. It's not a concrete trough. We've tested it with... Uh, various uh, plastic tubes uh, as well as the, the big plastic mm. basins and we get the same results yep, which is an average yes. growth of between one to two centimeters mm. uh, a year uh, a month rather um, which is vastly quicker yes than anything that we see yeah. in uh, yes you're talking orders of magnitude of that yeah. difference here yeah. so the, the point is because if you go to some caves today, say Cheddar Gorge, UK, yeah. or Genoan caves, for instance, um, are these stalactites growing at this rate today? Well, yes, they are, but uh, the evolutionists will not admit that. Yes, yeah. And, and even if they're not growing at that rate they, today, yes. that doesn't say that they didn't grow faster in the past. Yes. I remember going to Cheddar Gorge and they were saying these took hundreds of millions of years to form, hundreds of thousands of years just to form this big cascading waterfall yes. of stalactite, right? Um, and they said, we know that based on the rates of growth today, right? So they're extrapolating backwards. When you go around the corner, they say, we know that there used to be much more water here in the past. Yes. And you think, well, hang on a minute. You're using your rates today mm. under today's conditions to calculate backwards, but you already admit conditions were different in the past. And this goes back to a philosophy known as uniformitarianism. What does yes. that mean? Yes, it means that everything stays the same. So if you have the same conditions, you will get the same rate of growth. If you have different conditions, so if you have a cave that is now in a dry environment, no, it won't be growing as fast. But you cannot match the cave in the dry environment to a cave that would have been 
or that we know would have been in a wet environment or is currently in a wet environment. But uh, uniformitarianism is an idea that everything has happened at the same rate. And so if they see something growing slowly, they think, well, it's always grown slowly. Mm. But we know from observing different environments today that that's not true. Mm. And so the, the guy who was really accredited with popularising the idea yes. of uniformitarianism, because it's not a new idea, mm. it's a very, very old idea, uh, and the guy who was really popularised, uh, credited with popularising, mm. is a guy called Charles Lyell, yes. who was a mentor to Charles Darwin, mm. and he really got modern uh, society mm. to accept and to promote mm. an idea of deep time, millions mm. of years. And it was arguments like this, uh, like, you know, whether yes. it's rock formation, like Stalin mm. or erosion, yes. like Niagara Falls and the Grand Canyon, he argued, well, we observe very slow levels of erosion, very slow levels of formation today. Therefore, extrapolate backwards, it must have taken millions of years uh, to get to this point that we are today. And Charles Lyell, mentor to Charles Darwin, really enabled Charles Darwin to go on and develop the theory of evolution. He said, quote, unquote, my aim is to free science from Moses. In other words, this is, an, is this an anti-God philosophy that we're dealing with here? Oh, yes. Charles Lyell, he was a politician and a lawyer as much as anything. I and mean, he was a lawyer by profession. He had a lot of connections with politicians. And they had an agenda. And it was to get rid of the authority of scripture, particularly the authority of Genesis or the authority of Moses, as in he acknowledging that Moses actually wrote the first five books of the Bible. So that is the law, yeah. which, of course, is the basis of the law of, of England. So there was a political, philosophical agenda behind this. It was not science. And it's not just the basis of like the English law, which is ultimately yeah. founded on originally Christianity, but... The law, because we often view, we, we like in our brains to try and kind of break down the scripture into different categories. So we yes. have the law, then you have history, and then you have poetry like Job and the Psalms, and then you have, uh, you know, the, 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 the prophets, yes. prophetic works. So. And a lot of people, because he says law, a lot of people shove that into a separate category to history. And while Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy is the law, it contains the law in the sense that it is the basis for Christianity, it also contains an awful lot of history yes. as well. Because even through, say, Leviticus, which is mm. perhaps the most law-filled book of, of the, the tour, mm. like the law, yeah. there's still history that's going on there. Mm. It's still Moses instructing people from what God has instructed Moses. There's still accounts of what is going on with the children of Israel. And that's the same going back to Exodus as well. And there's a lot of law in there, yes. Ten Commandments, most famously. Yes, but you do have the history, the captivity, and the exodus, the removal of God's people yes. out of Egypt. And if we go back to Genesis, there's law in there as well, in the sense that it is God establishing various covenants, a covenant to Abraham, a covenant to Noah, and a covenant to Adam and to Eve as well, specifically to Eve, the, the promise of the seed who is Jesus yes. Christ. And so there is real history in Genesis as well that needs to be paid attention to just as much as the law which is there because it is the foundation of not just all of christianity but it answers the question was why are we here why is there sin why is there death why is there all this struggle so it's it's really vital to start with scripture as scripture intends it to be taken history law or otherwise yes law has to be based on reality it has to be based on the real world what has happened in the real world you cannot just pluck it out of the air or invent your own, so you can't base history on fairy tales or fantasy or anything like that. It has to be rooted in reality. So that's why law and history are inextricably linked. So if you destroy the history or people's understanding of the history, you can then change the law. And that was the aim of people like Lyell and his political colleagues. And that's the point that the Apostle Paul made as well. You know, if Jesus Christ did not really come, if he did not really die, if he did not really rise again, then our faith is futile, it's worthless, it's pointless, we're still in our sins. So Christianity is a fact-based faith. It's based on the reality of creation, the reality of a good creation, the reality of man's sin and the need for a saviour, and therefore is relies on the reality that that saviour did actually come. Well, I didn't think we were going to get this deep into theology just from stalactites and stalagmites, but it's so vital and it shows you why we need to do these kind of stuff, why we need to do these experiments and present this 
real world history, this real world experiment, real life experiment, because it is directly affected or connected rather to the gospel. Yes, indeed. If you undermine the history, the real history of the real world, you are undermining the gospel. Well, let's move on into uh, into here, Diane. So mm. I'm going to come around here if you want to. Yeah, really coming for a bit of a squeeze, but come up, guys, close the camera. Um, so in here we have a, a selection of our um, different stalactites examples from around the world. So on the, the middle shelf here, we have a, a, a collection of our fast tights, our fast forming tights. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom two shelves and the top shelf are stalactite examples from all over the world. So all yes. stuff from mm -hmm. stalactites, these big uh, uh, veils or, or yes. I think they call them bacon strips in the States. That's why I was <laughs> told by our, 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 our USA rep anyway. Um, <laughs> Mm. Greece, these beautiful yes. ribbon stalactites from uh, mm. from from Malaysia, oh, beautiful, yes. great big. Mm. Um, and this was actually all the one collection of uh, a retired geologist who travelled all over the world and collected mm. all these kind of things. So really beautiful stalactites and stalagmites. These gorgeous things from uh, from caves in the UK as well. Just uh, amazing mm. that we were able to to get hold of them. But let's just talk about some of the fast tights and compare yes. them particularly mm -hmm. to some of the real life examples. So if we look at this one, this is one that John Mackay collected a few years back. It's a nice <laughs> a nice big one. This is just off the old Roman road, um, you know, the Watling Street oh, yes. we were talking about the other day. So uh, in a uh, in a big quarry and mm -hmm. John ended up um, going into the quarry sort of, you know, chest deep in water. <laughs> it's now closed <laughs> off. But what was interesting is it had only been shut down 40 years before. Right. So in just 30 to 40 years mm -hmm. you'd had these beautiful stalactites form in just a, a short little yes. while and this is a proper stalactite oh yeah it's got all the layers in it you can yes. see it's not yes. white and flimsy and hollow it's a it's mm -hmm. a full-blown stalactite so that's yes. a, a really nice and very important example of a big stalactite mm -hmm. that's formed in just a few years mm -hmm. and these were from a, a castle if you want to have a oh, have yes. those. so mm -hmm. these are actually stalag might so yes. let's just run it out. Stalic tight hangs on the ceiling because it has yeah. to hang on tight. Yes. Stalic might grows up from the floor because it might yeah. one day reach the ceiling, and so that's a good way of remembering it. Yeah. So this is one of those stalic mites that grows up, and this was from a place called Deal Castle down in Kent, and we were down in there, and they were just dripping. It was all made of limestone because yes. this is the mm. land of the White Cliffs of Dover, oh, yes. and all that, mm. and it was just dripping down and reducing these in uh, and I got to actually speak to the uh, curator yeah. there and yeah. they have to go through every few years and clear them all out because they're just <laughs> going so much so it's yeah. uh yeah, yeah something like that happens yeah. in just a few years and yeah. it's a proper proper solid oh yeah yes it's it's solid it's, it's rock solid yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is, is exactly that, uh, yeah. that point now this is an interesting one here which I quite like. We actually got this from our, our good friend Vance Nelson. Ah, yes. Uh, who yes. did a lot of work on, on rapid mm. rocks and uh, yes. fossilisation yeah. and the like. So what you can see here, we've got this lovely uh, metal water pipe mm. on the outside. It's rusty yes. on the outside, cut through. But then on the inside, uh, this is a water pipe from the Colour of Avari, the Czech Republic. Mm. And mm. it's where the water is flowing, the rich mineral water. It's where you get the fossilised paper roses and the like oh, from, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> but what's amazing is that it's actually built up because they noticed mm. within just a couple of months <laughs> that the water flow had drastically dropped mm. going through these pipes. Yes, and you can see what's been built up. These beautiful. Mm. It looks like a cut stalactite. It does. Yes. And, and it's just, it's just it's mm. spot on, exactly like a cut. Mm. With all this, and this is a mineral called aragonite, which is mm. a form of calcium carbonate. Yes. It happens in just months. Yes. So it's, it's about a process. Yes. Yes, that's right. And and this can be a real problem with underground pipes and in mines. Mm. Um, one of our colleagues uh, who uh, worked in mines uh, brought us along a great big uh, mass of calcium carbonate which had formed within the mine. We knew how old the mine was, certainly wasn't millions of years. Uh, oh, well, it was a big mass of aragonite and the yeah. like that had formed all mm. the way around a big bush that had fallen in the mine as well. I think that's in the, in the Creation Museum yes. collection. So, mm. um, good example again of mm. process. Nothing to do with time, 
everything to do with the process and it's a really beautiful example of that that really does show that process factor when it comes to uh, these kinds of things so there's a really nice uh, example there well let's go on to um this example here because we can now start to sort of compare things so this is some research that we did at um church canal tunnel which is just down the road oh, yes, yes, there last year. There, yes. and inside there there's all these stalactites yes. and we the, the the actual mm. tunnel itself is only a couple of hundred years old. So yes. we've formed in the last mm. couple of hundred years. We've mm. been down and done pH testing all the way along. Mm. It's really much a cave condition because it was designed for constant water. Uh, it was designed for constant uh, winds or very low levels of wind. So the air would only travel one way, very low wind, pretty much a consistent temperature all the year round. And it's full of these stalactites uh, and little tiny stalagmites that are coming up. Now, we have tested all of these uh, you know, chemical tests, pH tests. It certainly is a stalagmite, but what's interesting is this is forming on the side, right, on the tunnel. So the tunnel yes. is kind of going over like that. It's forming on the side. So you actually have these little what are called helotites, yes. which rather than hanging down mm. or coming up, they're actually sticking out <laughs> to the but side. Okay. But if you compare yeah. this, we've got some examples here mm. from a cave in mm. the, in from Poland. Yes. And, and you can actually see there's our big stalactite, right, mm. that's forming. But look at this edge here. Yes. Can you see that edge yes. just sitting there? It's got that same, that same, got that same thing. thing. In fact, you can actually put it up next to it mm. and you can actually see the similarities there. So it's actually a good way of being able to test, as the scriptures say, yes. test all things yeah. and to compare between a real world cave example and a modern, much quicker example. And you can look at the two and say, well, if this didn't take millions of years, what is the reason to assume that this one did? Mm. And particularly when you add in the factor of the organic material. And what's really fascinating about that actually is at one end of the Canal Tunnel, you get lots and lots of these stalactites. Yes. At the other end, you get nothing. Mm. But the level of water remains mm. pretty much the same. And the argument is, from a secular perspective, that stalactites are water plus calcium carbonate. And as you pointed out earlier, calcium carbonate doesn't really dissolve in water. So the argument is it takes hundreds of thousands of years to create a dissolving solution and then to redeposit that as a stalactite and stalagmite. But with this canal tunnel, we have constant water and constant calcium carbonate. Yet one end of the tunnel, there's plenty of these stalactites. They cover the walls. Yes. On the other end, there's nothing. What's the only discernible difference? Well, at one end, the canal tunnel is covered in vegetation up above the actual tunnel itself. Big woods, thick decaying leaves and all that kind of stuff. At the other end, it's residential. There's a road that goes over the top of it. It's got houses and concrete and everything. Now, I wonder if the real reason here is more to do with that organic component, the uh, mulch, the decaying material, the microbes. And we were actually working with uh, a professor from the University of St. Andrews, professor of chemistry. Um, John and I were working with him a little while back, and we were really delving into looking at some of these specifics when it comes to the enzymes that these microbes produce. And what we find is that there's these microbes which are present in decaying material and matter with they're you know, present here in the uh, decaying material that we have in these standard type machines. They're present in the world, which produce an enzyme which only exists for a fraction of a second, but that enzyme is extremely acidic, sometimes up to minus 50. Now, to put that into perspective, vinegar and hydrochloric acid, they're sort of somewhere on the sort of, you know, one to two kind of scale, right? Uh, so we're talking about something extremely acidic. Now, yes, it doesn't last for very long, but it's there for a short period of time and it would produce the perfect conditions for breaking down these materials, these base materials, and redepositing them as stalactites. So microbes really seem to be the key here. Yes, indeed. And uh, so that fits with what we observe in places like the Chirk Tunnel, mm -hmm. which is a short-lived... Um, uh, environment because we know how old the canal was. It was yes. built for, yeah. for for a canal, so we we have the real history there, um, as well as these experiments where we've deliberately set them up. So there's no evidence of long periods of time. There is evidence of changing conditions where you get changing chemical and physical environments. So it gets back. You've got to have the right physical and chemical processes. Right. Time is irrelevant. 
And uh, it really, it really is the, the key yeah. that we've seen so many times in this. It's got nothing to do with yeah. time, everything to do with the process. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you think about it, we know this in the real world as well. If you are a foreman or a businessman and you're trying to do, you employ people who have better processes or you implement better processes, <laughs> right? You don't just leave it in time and hope for the best. So we know how it relates to us. We know that it makes sense. And it's about getting that bigger picture and relating yes. that back to the gospel. As we were saying earlier, these issues really do have influence or they really are, um, they do affect the way that we understand things about millions of years and stereotypes will have an impact on how we view the gospel. So we need to start from scripture yes. and work out what's that way. Yes, we need to start with the God of the real world who created in the beginning and told the truth about it. Now, we've done lots and lots of work on stalactites and stalagmites of creation research. Obviously, if you're in Australia, go and visit Jurassic Ark, uh, yes. where they've got about six or seven machines going on the go now. Uh, and there's a portable one similar to this in the Tasmanian Museum as well. We want to get one set up in the USA as well. We're going to yes. develop more of these. Come and get involved and mm. see. But um, if you go to creationresearch.net, you'll be able to click on the research reports and you'll be able to see all of the reports on stalactites and stalagmites because there's about 12 or 13 of them yes, there yes. now. You can read about the history of them and all the different experiments and the, the triumphs and the failures. That Indeed. All experiments involved those. I think one of our, my favourite <laughs> ones is when we actually noticed that leaves were getting caught in a naturally mm. forming stalactite underneath a bridge in the UK. Yes. We told John about mm. it and between you, John and Dow developed that same system in one of the stalactite yes. machines and mm. that was a real success. It was actually, it was a better success than we planned. We actually uh, started out by placing leaves into it, but they blew away because this is all outside. Yeah. But the same wind that blew away our leaves blew us and more in, and they got stuck. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it is <laughs> to a bully naturally, you know, and it shows that you don't have to cheat sometimes that's to right. see the same it, results. It wasn't <laughs> contrived at all. <laughs> so go and check out creationresearch.net, click on the research tab and you'll be able to find experiments on the stalactites and the stalagmites. Another very good program that you can watch, you can look on our YouTube channel, we've done programs on creation conversations about tights and mites and uh, we've done programs on standing for truth on their channel but also there you can see the the, the Chirk Canal Tunnel and stuff but if you go and search for the tour around Jurassic Ar uh, Arc um, you will be able to actually see exactly examples of these stalactites and stalagmites as well um, in the actual machines themselves. They're available there. So go and check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, Diane, just remind people uh, how they can follow us and uh, sign up to the newsletters while I'll go and grab a very brief commercial. Yes, if you go to our main website, it's easy to remember, creationresearch.net. So creationresearch.net. And you can go to that. You can sign up for our newsletter. There's a page for that. You can go to the research reports where you can read articles about them. And if you click on the YouTube icon, that will take you to our YouTube channel where we have a lot of our videos from the past and from our new videos that we're making at the moment, including these ones. And if yes. you want all the research in one place, yes. Tides, Mites and Fossil Fights is our, this is the second edition updated with extra pages of research. And the great thing about this is this is not stock footage. This is not just general image. This is all fossils that are either in our museum collection or real experiments that we have done in the real world. All about tights and mites. There's our Chirk mm. Canal, uh, which was the extra yes. programs we added. Mm. You can find stalactites in the USA, in Australia. This is stuff that is really all over the world, including some fabulous fossils examples as well uh, here in the UK and in Australia. So go and check that out. And be sure to join us next time in Around the Museum with Joe and Diane. Yes. God bless, guys. Catch you around. Check out Creation Research Live, our all-new streaming service for creation research. With thousands of free resources and access to all of Creation Research's premium documentaries, debates, and presentations through a low-cost monthly subscription. Find out more at creationresearch.live. Be sure to sign up to the Creation Evidence News. Regular updates and news from the world of creation research, science and the latest evidence for creation. Why not visit one of the many creation research museums around the globe? Find out more at creationresearch.net.